I have to say, like uh, here and in general in Denmark, is always a teamwork. And um, uh, to me, it's completely different compared to, you know, uh, Italy, where maybe um, you have the project manager or uh, the project director or the owner taking the decision. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Creative Insider Podcast. In this episode, we had the pleasure to have on Italian architect and computational design expert Eliana Nigro. Eliana is currently working at Kobe, which is one of the leader in architecture in Denmark and in the world. So it was a very interesting and entertaining conversation. So I suggest you to go through the whole thing and pay attention. Before we start, I want to remind you that this show, this podcast is possible only through your support and you could have watched this podcast live. So if you want to watch the next one live, you can check the link below uh, to our Patreon. If you join the community, you can watch every single episode, participate in the Q&A at the end of the episode. You have premier access before the episodes are released and we have also a monthly community call. I hope to see you there and you to be part of the community. But if you cannot afford it, I understand you can support though the show for free by just clicking the like button on this video so that the algorithm can support it. And also by subscribing to the channel, that would be very helpful for us. Thank you very much and enjoy the conversation with Eliana Nigro. Hey. Hello, Eliana. Hi. Good evening. How are you? Very, very good. Very excited. Thank you. And I thank you for inviting me. Such a pleasure to be part of your podcast. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, I was thinking about it. I'm super happy that um, finally I managed to have a um, guest from Kobe because I'm a huge fan of The Office. And um, okay. I have also your book. And I have also... Oh, I'm so jealous. And also Dan. Dan, I met Dan in Munich and he wrote a dedication to me in the book. So okay. I'm officially... So actually, welcome to Kobe and you should come and visit us in I, Copenhagen. I, w I, I came to Copenhagen in May last year and I was even in the coffee shop. So maybe you pass by me. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but I didn't know anyone. Next time you're gonna tell me. Yes, I didn't know anyone from Kobe uh, when I came, and uh, I did also. There is a series of vlogs uh, for the people who don't know. Um, there is a series of vlogs that are uh, available online, and they're called "Visit Copenhagen Like an Architect." And one of the episodes, we go to the coffee shop in Kobe and show the models and everything. So. Okay. Maybe I missed it. When yeah. was it? it? It's on the YouTube channel. If you click through the playlist. Yeah, when, when were you here? I don't remember. Like exactly. But it wasn't an official visit. I just came and uh, just filmed. I had a camera. I, ha I did it actually with my phone. It was in May. In the beginning of May. May. Okay. And uh, we were super lucky because uh, it was a little chilly for, f for May. But I think it wasn't chilly for Copenhagen. And uh, it was very sunny, and then um, and it was very nice. And we we walked every day 20 kilometers because we visited all the projects possible from every office possible in Copenhagen. And then a lot of people that I know through the podcast told me, "Oh, you see so many things that even me that I live here, I didn't know they were <laughs> they were this building in in Copenhagen." So we visit also different projects from from the company from Kobe among others and it was it was very nice and uh, I'm finally so excited because we've been uh, organizing this uh, several weeks months shortly before Christmas I connected to you and I was so excited uh, to have you on so welcome to the podcast thank you <laughs> Ooh, I'm excited too <laughs> let's do it you're um, the um, computational design, head of computational design, as far as I understood, computational design yeah. expert at um, Kobe. Uh, if you, I don't know if you have listened to some of our podcasts, but uh, it's also about understanding uh, 
who you are, not only what you do nowadays, but to understand how you arrive to where you are nowadays so that people yeah. can get inspired by your path or also like people that are maybe now studying, they can get inspired to go to follow your path or people that are on already have some experience may somehow try to change direction and uh, go in your way. So you're Italian. I'm always surprised that it's amazing mm -hmm. how many <laughs> Italians are. Uh, and you didn't know because at one point that I like I actually was uh, checking on you and I I was like ah you you probably know because I saw you studied in Italy and uh, yeah and then you were oh my god are you Italian and I was like yes <laughs> yeah I never know yes I'm Italian. Because I live in Germany and there are many Italians, but they don't speak Italian because they uh, were born here. So I always have to first ask what was the case. So what was the case with you? Where are you from and why did you decide that you wanted to become uh, an architect? Oh, an architect. Well, I think uh, more than decide. I think I like to say that I became an architect because of a dog. So when I was a little girl, I was literally obsessed with the dogs. I had, uh, you know, huge posters, stickers, pens, T-shirts, everything with the dogs. And it was, a, of course, like a recurring theme in my family. And my parents would uh, tell me that we couldn't get any dog because of our tiny apartment. So uh, I would go to the closest uh, Technocasa shop where you can get, you know, this magazine with the pictures, the prices, <laughs> description, the, you know, the drawings. And I would go there with my dad and um, I would spend quite a long time digging into the book. Um, and I was uh, very young when uh, the process started and it lasted like for six, seven years. So very long. So my dad was trying, you know, to keep me uh, <laughs> the, the kind of trying to find excuses why we were not buying certain apartments. And uh, he would tell me, hi, Liana, you know, this is perfect. What do, we are missing a bathroom here or we are missing a bedroom. So I, I, I really wanted this dog. So, you know, I was spending time by trying to fit it in. And uh, at one point I was like just trying to, uh, you know, image my own and do this. Um, this kind of axle and I was dreaming big you know I wanted the villa with uh, two three floors I was also dreaming of having some sliders the garden and of course the small uh, house for the dog um, but none of these ever ever happened and we just moved into another apartment but I have all these uh, beautiful memories of my dad and I going um into many different apartments in uh, the in uh, in the cities and you know even on construction side so i have this uh, memory of the concrete from my childhood but I wasn't dreaming of becoming an architect. So I was obsessed with animals uh, because, you know, I couldn't get the dog. So what I would do with the money that my grandma would slide under the table, you know, at Sunday, like every good Italian uh, grandmother, I would go to the shop and uh, try to adopt every kind of animal. So I had everything, like a lot of uh, goldfish, uh, parrots, uh, rabbits, turtles. At one point, I even got a chicken, but no dogs allowed in uh, in our apartment. So I was this kind of kid having uh, books about uh, animals. And uh, yeah, there were no Lego involved in my childhood. Maybe more clay. I liked more like free forms and do my own jewelry and of course tiny dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, I was dreaming, I was dreaming to become a scientist. I wanted to go in a laboratory and do like crazy experiments and uh, find out something uh, great. But, you know, like everyone, when I turned uh, 17, 18, I started to wonder what to do with my life. And uh, it's a moment where you are very confused that you start to dig into your past and try to understand what, uh, yeah, who you want to be. And uh, I, at that point, liked both humanistic and uh, scientific subjects. Uh, and, you know, I had this... Um, 
yeah, still the passion for uh, drawing and this kind of a weird obsession for Techno Casa magazine, even if, you know, it was done technically, is uh, something I still uh, do today. You know, I go on a website and uh, I love, I love apartments. Um, so for the people and, and, who know, haven't I... lived in Italy, Techno Casa, it's like a website that sells homes. <laughs> so... Yes. <laughs> but when I was, you know, four or five uh, till uh, like uh, 13 years old, back then, uh, you, you could just get it like in your hands. And I think it was so amazing. I don't know. I, I love it. Um, it was it was so, so, so great f- for me. Um, yeah, so. So at the end, you know, I, I I didn't know what to do when uh, no one I knew was an architect and my parents are in uh, very different fields. So I, I I think, you know, I thought uh, maybe I try and I get to know how to put those stones together and do my own villa one day and get the dog. <laughs> and then you, you didn't yeah. know that in, in the end of the day, the real estate guy is the one who has the money to get the house and not the architect. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's okay. It's also still fun. Still fun. Um, and which part of Italy are you from? Where where did you get your education? I'm uh, from uh, south. I'm from Napoli. Oh, the best food in Italy yeah. is from Napoli. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's so funny because all the people that... I don't interview Italians because I aim to. It's just because everywhere there are Italians doing design, a part of Italy, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and uh, everybody moving abroad. And, um, and so you studied in Naples, your university, your education. Yeah. Where did you get your education? I studied at uh, Federico II. So it's uh, yeah, it's the most ancient. Uh, actually, most ancient uh, university in Europe. Uh, and yeah, they have, you know, this uh, wonderful holistic approach where uh, they teach you a lot of history, but also construction, physics, m- math, um, a lot of structures involved. So you end up having a very uh, whole, um, I don't know, idea uh about uh, architecture. I think it's a very good program, but at the same time, it wasn't so innovative at the time. You know, um, resources were quite limited, so we didn't even have a laser cutter, or sometimes we wouldn't find enough electrical plugs for uh, our laptops, so (laughs) it was a completely different world uh, compared to where I am today. I feel uh, very spoiled here in Denmark. And and then you did your both bachelor and master there, or did you study somewhere else? Yeah, I actually joined. Um, you know, it's called uh, Five EU or something like that, but it's uh, five full years. Uh, so it's like bachelor and master oh, all together. You did the same, the same as me. Uh, I did the same, yeah. but in 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 Rome. So I understand what you're talking about. Ah, nice. I love it also because there is a lot of engineering involved. And yeah, back then, as I told you, I I wanted to become a scientist. So I I had this uh, love for uh, math, physics, and these uh, things. <laughs> and uh, and that what did you do? Some sort of a exchange program or something to try something different? No. Or? No, 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 not at all. I really regret it. Uh, but uh, yeah, again, uh, I have to say, I don't think that in the south of Italy, parents really encourage children to leave their home. It's a stereotype, but in my case, it's very much true. Uh, so while I was uh, studying, I was uh, full on into this uh, Italian mentality that, you know, you just have to perform as much as possible, be super, super fast and uh, finish your studies. So, you know, I had the, the, the dream of trying, you know, the Erasmus program, but uh, I wasn't brave enough uh, back then to to even apply and it's something I really regret right now. 
Yeah, but in the end of the day, you managed to <laughs> to experience it later on. In yeah, your I know, I know somehow, <laughs> somehow yes. But uh, when I, you know, every time I meet young people, I um, I always, uh, especially Italians, I always uh, try to show them how different life can be. And here in Denmark, they have a very different approach. Um, it's uh, super fascinating for me. I couldn't believe it because. Um, Uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, then after high school, they actually have the opportunity to uh, go. It's not really universities. It's like a place where you can experiment what you like. Like you can join something where they do design and architecture. And then for six months or a year, uh, you get started and you get to know what they what they do. Uh, so at the end, you can uh, make an informed decision. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it's so nice and here another thing i really like is that uh, it's something people say very often is take your time uh and uh yeah it's um yeah people really experience i, I feel i uh, do many experiences and yeah i don't know it yeah, it's mind-blowing for me they 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 take it slower also here in germany I had the same thing because in italy there is this mentality that you have to be as quick as possible to finish your studies and then you have to have this sort of linear linear path towards your future and mm. the, in north of europe they maybe they don't they don't have this social pressure and everybody are more relaxed and and what at what point of your um experience in architecture whether as a student or whether um or whether as as a professional you discovered this passion for computational design um and yeah how did you get mm. what was that's that another memory you? yeah go ahead <laughs> i'm very curious to hear yeah i <laughs> so you know i i i clearly remember the first time i turned on a grasshopper Uh, and I was just uh, lying in bed with my laptop, very, very relaxed, and I had no expectations at all. Uh, and I started, you know, to drop all these components into the canvas, uh, and I couldn't stop for the entire day. I felt like a kid in a playground. Uh, I was having a lot of fun, and I had uh, this uh, feeling that uh, finally I was finding something that was talking like my brain, which... When I say this to people, they are just, oh my God, you're so smart. Not at all. It's a nightmare. I'm an overthinker. And in my brain, there are a lot of boxes connected with the wires. And it's always about what else, uh, what else if, uh, uh, then, uh, or, and it's, it, yeah. So it was very intuitive uh, for me, grasshopper. So great for a professional life, having this brain in personal life, not so great. Um, but I remember that moment, uh, like trying out grasshopper, uh, also because um, I felt I was committing some kind of sin. Because as I told you, I was in the south of Italy in this uh, very strict uh, traditional uh, university. And the professors would always just encourage us to do straight lines and work with the classical 90 degree angle. And I was very young, uh, very, very young. And I uh, I didn't know what bad or good architecture was. So uh, I kept it more or less like a secret. Uh, but I continued to use grasshopper because I thought it was very smart. You know, why would you draw something and then delete it and do it, <laughs> doing it again, just right? Uh, I, 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 I was always like preferring to, um, to do some kind of script and then, you know, play with the parameters. So I would somehow try to get uh, as fast as I could. Uh, and, uh, you, but I was also lucky uh, along my path because they were actually some very inspiring people that I met. And uh, first of all, it was my professor of geometry. She's 
um, very passionate woman um, called Mara Capone, and uh, she would show us uh, how to generate uh, complex geometries starting from like very simple elements. And uh, more than that, she would show us pictures of architecture where uh, those uh, shapes um, were used. And, uh, you know, that was uh, so exciting for me. And um, still, it was at the beginning of the years, but uh, it, it was very powerful. And the same year, I was also very lucky to be in the room when a guy from Zadid came uh, to to give you know, just one one lecture about the relationship between nature and architecture. So at that point, again, animals were coming in. So he was he was explaining, you know, why butterflies are shaped uh, that way, and uh, you know, I am I. Uh, it was very impressive, and I could see there was uh, so much more to explore. But it, it was only later, you know, when I was uh, getting closer to my thesis uh, that I found, you know, the courage to came out as a grasshopper person. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> seriously, it was like I am, of course, there were like some professors we, which were who were more open-minded. So um, uh, some of them, they would actually call me in to do competitions with them. So there were people who knew and I had like a lot of friends coming by and, you know, asking for um, some tools. Um, but it was really for uh, my thesis my that I uh was, you know, trying to get out. Um, and uh, But my approach was very, very soft because I I went back to that same t uh, professor like Mara Capone and I was like ah, I really like that what do you think about it and she actually got so excited and I started to uh, study uh, history actually and all these uh, characters like uh, um, Gaudi of course but uh, Nervi, Musmeshi, Isler, uh, Candela they, like they are doing these awesome concrete shells I was um, Yeah, it was so interesting. And then I decided to join the engineering university to take some courses. And I was studying um, finite element method. Um, so I would uh, try to analyze uh, structurally these uh, like complex shapes. And uh, while uh, like studying more and more and more, then uh, I decided to join one of the first courses by Arturo Tedeschi in Milan. It was form five finding strategies and it was two days very intense workshop uh, and at my level of brass supper was already intermediate but that was also super inspiring to finally see someone using the software because you know back then there were not so many uh I think there were no tutorials it, 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 there was not so much knowledge about it so Uh, it was very, very interesting for me to see um, the the approach and also to start to um, uh, like something so specific and technical like uh, structural analysis. And we were using, I don't know if you know, these plugins like uh, Kangaroo, Karamba. Uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I think that was the the first, uh, the, the very first years. The, what what uh, year was as, that? You know, the, Around uh, what year? I started university in uh, in twenty. Uh, oh, I don't know. To, in uh, okay, it doesn't matter. You don't, you don't remember, but people. Could oh my god! Two thousand and uh, yeah, but it, there was not even uh, the first, uh, you know, uh, official release uh, of Grasshopper when I started. So, so the, I think the first, uh, the if first... I'm not wrong, the very first official one is in 2014. Um, so it was a bit earlier than that. I, I've heard, I've heard of Grasshopper the first time. I think in 2011, I was still in school because I was studying in a yeah, school. Yeah, exactly. I was uh, in the. Um, um artistic high school so i was doing architecture already in school and uh, i had a friend that was a few years older and he showed me he told me yeah, there is this office in london zaha did and it was very famous in <laughs> rome because they are were opening the maxi museum 
<laughs> Maxi. Yeah, and they were and they were using Grasshopper, and the first time I heard about it was around that year. And uh, yeah, he showed me you can do this crazy mm. stuff and things like that. It's um, a, it's a, around the same uh, period of time. So it's uh, when uh, there was like uh, still a lot of excitement and uh, also a lot of uh, misconception about uh, the software. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, there was uh, this uh, misunderstanding that uh, if you use that software, oh, my God, you're going to do some crazy aesthetic. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It was not so many people in my school were excited about it. And, um, and you mentioned so, something that once you open it for the first time, it was kind of like working similarly to your mind. Do you have a very mathematical mm. and logical mind or do you have, because I always ask this, like a lot of people yes. tell me that in order to use Grasshopper, you have to forget about how you draw. Uh, like you have mm. to forget about the same way as you're drawing. Uh, but they also yeah. say, but you don't have to be like crazy mathematics and things like that. You no, have to just that's un- true. But in my case is uh, a bit different because I I think I when I, when I was doing I was already quite good in three uh, D modeling in Rhino, and uh, the I think that's why I also mentioned geometry as being something very important to me and that professor specifically because the way I learned she was not teaching us the software but just you know the logic uh, of geometries so every time I was uh, modeling something I would uh, uh, think step by step and in general I am a big fan of math and geometry so I I have to say I I am a very much a logic um, organized uh, person uh, but uh, for sure everyone can learn it Uh, and I'm not saying like oh my god you have to be this way it's just uh, to me it was kind of very natural because I was already um, unfortunately thinking (laughs) like you know oh now I do a point then I do a spear then I cut it you know (laughs) like okay so but but that's kind of easy to to to, I mean it's maybe harder to understand exactly the tools but I guess that if you have the right mindset and uh, maybe you go really deep into the topic it's not so hard to to understand um, and you, you mentioned you used it for, for everything in university, like secretly. Did you use it also to do like any kind of, because you said also in the, in the meanwhile, uh, people um, at your university were appreciating more traditional shapes. And I have to say, for mm-hmm. example, the projects of um, Kobe, they're like some, some exceptions have a little bit more of a crazier shape, like uh, organic, let's mm-hmm. say. Uh, because what I appreciate about the company is that it has this very good uh, taste of translating tra- tra- uh, traditional architecture in a modern language that it's not not uh, so cheesy, not so like fake new, mm-hmm. fake old, but it's uh, yeah. inspired by the old and trans- translated into something that it's modern and relatable to nowadays. Would you model everything in Grasshopper, also like your walls and doors and everything in Grasshopper? Well, t- or you- well, 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 today, yes, but in the past, uh, not everything, of course, not, not everything, it, um, because of course I was also learning, uh, but everything for me was kind of a gym, you know, I o- always wanted to test it out, but they were I have to say there were like some uh, figures in uh, in the school that would let us um, like do some more like um especially the people I helped, uh, they were like doing digital fabrication uh, or uh, acoustic optimization. So, um, or other people that were into structural analysis. So, um, uh, you know, um, especially towards the end, you would find like, um, and you would also choose different ateliers. You know, at the beginning, you don't really know, um, much about the school and then it, you know you you get to talk with the older people and uh, you get to understand a bit more what you like and in which direction you want to go so then uh, at the end it's actually possible was possible back then to have some people who were who would let you explore explore more i see i see and um at what point in your life you joined the 
real architecture like professionally because you've worked uh, in several offices. What was your first job uh, where you started working? How did it happen? And, mm -mm -mm. and were your skill, uh, skills in Grasshopper helpful in order for you to get this job? Okay. Okay, you have to know that my dream was another one. So when I joined university, uh, my dream was to become a professor. So um, let's say that um, uh, I, I was one of those Italians, you know, that was uh, going straight in a line. And I was like, okay, so after my thesis, then I do PhD, then I do this, this, and then I become a professor. Um, instead... When I got my thesis, then I understood there were like some technicalities. So I had to wait a few months before, you know, in Napoli, we have exams to enter the PhD. So I, um, at that point, I was already uh, teaching in school. Uh, and, um, but, uh, you know, when you follow some courses, it's never full time. So I had some time and I was like, how can I invest my time? What can I do? I want to like, uh, you know, I, I was again in that mentality. I want to be efficient. I want to be efficient. So I found this uh, post-graduation master in a UAV in Venice um, that was uh, having courses only during the weekend. And uh, I sent there my application and uh, they have like some kind of selection. I got in um, and uh, I started this uh, crazy period of my life because I would take a train and I'd go from Napoli to Venice, have my weekend of courses, then I'd go back, have the lectures at university. And since I wanted to be super efficient, I would, uh, you know, study also for my architectural license on top. And you know, okay, I was young, I had a lot of energies, but I ended up being exhausted. I, I, I was re like, it, it was really a lot. Um, so at one point I decided, okay, I need, um, you know, to take a choice. And um, I spoke uh, with the, the professor and she was actually very kind because she let me, you know, collaborate only for articles kind of remotely, you know, from Venice. So I could move there. And uh, that was very good for getting more and more skills because this master is called MADI uh, and is about digital architecture, so advanced technologies. And we would study NURBS modeling, um, polygonal mod modeling, so not only Rhino, but also uh, 3ds Max, Maya. We would uh, do renderings with Vuray and uh, Corona video animation, coding, Grasshopper, Arduino, and, you know, the resources were completely different. I to me, it was a paradise. I could finally, you know, use a, an actual 3D printer. <laughs> yeah, like, it, it was absolutely amazing. So that was another huge uh, chunk, uh, huge step into skilling myself. Um, and also, when I was there, so many doors um, open up for me. So... <laughs> So I was at that point um, kind of, um, there is this a title in uh, university called Cultore della Materia, is is um, kind of a, an expert, a specialist, and uh, I was specialized in uh, geometries. Um, so uh, um, it was kind of a bit easier for me through UOV to find uh, connections to other companies. So first, I my first actual job uh, was with a museum. <laughs> it is the Museum of Kaurle and I would do this um, 3D modeling of ancient weapons. So something something else, like n uh, it was no architecture, but That's it's crazy. actually <laughs> really, yeah, cra like I don't know, like I would never think of doing something like that. I, I, I 
I don't know, but I loved modeling. So I was like, why not? And it was actually really, really useful because you get to model some shapes that you don't normally do in architecture. And uh, we would also do uh, the animations and um, the drawings, the 3D printing. So that was the first job. But again, with you of, so guys really like, I think when it, when a university have resources and connections, it's uh, it's actually really really helpful because if they would you know um, say okay let's make um, who who is interested and you would uh, send them their uh, your portfolio and they would uh, you know allow you to work with uh, these companies. So my second job with them uh, was with uh, Banca Ifis. So again, a bank, uh, <laughs> something else. But uh, this bank uh, was having a program called Botteghe Digitali, uh, which is actually, um, so they were investing money into some uh, companies in Italy to uh, let them um uh, you know, go more towards the digital world. And I decided to work with this company called Nomad Boards. And it's a super cool team who's doing uh, wooden <laughs> sustainable boards, like surfboard, skateboard, longboard. Um, and uh, um, what are they yeah. called again? So, again, Nomad. No, no made board. Uh, and uh, they have amazing, amazing stuff. Just check it out. I really like it. And um, uh, so the work I made, uh, I made together with them was to um, try to optimize their fabrication process uh, using a CNC machine. So uh, we work together into, you know, simplifying uh, the geometry in a way that actually we could use the machine because it's not flat. So you need to find like to be kind of creative and find other ways. Um, and uh, so we, we created together the, the first DIY uh, surfboard, um, wooden surfboard in Italy. Uh, we also started to look into customizing online the boards. And if you check online on YouTube, you will also find me because there is a, this a video that uh, Bottega Digitali made. Uh, so... You can find a very, very young me with long hair uh, talking about uh, <laughs> the how, how to do these uh, things. Um, and uh, yeah, that was also super interesting because I could uh, understand much more about wood. We were also doing wood bending. And um, especially uh, I was bringing, you know, the digital into reality. So I learned so so much especially because the machine we had back then they made it themselves like they made the cnc so you know you we had some some kind of big tolerances that we needed to consider uh, and uh, together with them i was um, going for some exhibitions in italy and uh, i went to bologna where a friend of mine uh, from federico II was working and he actually gave me a call. And since he was one of the guys I was helping with, you know, the parametric stuff in school, he told me, hey, we, we have this a concrete shell and we are searching for someone with your skills. Uh, do you want to do you want to come? Um, and uh, so. So I think uh, it was a period where for the first time. I left Napoli, I left my family, and I left my comfort zone. So at that point, I felt, you know, why not? I'm going to challenge myself a bit more. And let's see how, how is working for an office. So I went in Bologna to work for Mario Cucinella Architects. And, uh, you know, when doing this uh, concrete shell uh, in Salerno, which is uh, very close to my hometown, I felt, oh, okay, wow, actually, <laughs> actually, I can, uh, I can actually build something 
like, you know, the things I was studying and I, I thought that was very cool. And another factor at that point was that I would finally have uh, some money. So uh, I felt a bit more, uh, you know, uh, free um, and uh and brave and I was like okay now I can actually try to do something I was dreaming of because I was already regretting the Erasmus thing you know I had it always in my mind I was like why I wasn't so brave oh my god oh my god so I just uh, decided to do my portfolio in English and to send it out and then, uh, then uh, that's another story because I got my interview with the tricks and so my life completely uh, changed. Uh, but if I'm not wrong, we were talking also about skills. And one thing I want people to know is that it's important to never stop learning in this field because things always, always change. Um, and uh, I'm not afraid to say that I'm a workshop addict. So you will find me in many bit different workshops. I love it. You always get to, you know, to learn also different approaches in a lear- in a teaching. And um, uh, yeah, I- I'm very lucky to be in Denmark because they give you education funds, so they encourage you to study. That's in Germany and, uh, too. That's in Germany too. I have to say that uh, that's oh. probably somewhere everywhere northern in Italy you get that. <laughs> so you can But go. But that's awesome because I'm, I, you, you know, then at the end I got my, oh, probably there is a, some delay. No, no, you no. You were no, saying the, something. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. But uh, uh, so because at the end I, you know, in Italy I took my license and I'm part of the union there. And actually to keep your um, license, I don't yeah, know, you yeah. have to do courses. Yeah. But, you know, they don't like, it's not like here. They 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 actually give us, I think, 1,400 1, uh, Corona. So almost 200 euros a month to study. That's yeah, that's, that's great. Absolutely amazing. Like. Yeah. Denmark is awesome. I'm <laughs> no, I, I totally. <laughs> I think it's so funny to listen to your story because you mentioned like that the first time you went, um, out, like you got out of your comfort zone was when you moved to Bologna. But for me, listening the story of you studying at Madi during the weekend and going back to teach it was already quite crazy. So I think it's so funny how um, funny in a sense ironic that people are doing something super extraordinary for many others, oh. but in their little world, they don't see that it's so, um, that, that it's so an, an exceptional that because uh, not everyone would, uh, would do it. And I was curious um, in this whole story that you have told until now, which is for me personally, very interesting and very impressive. Uh, beside all the architecture, Thank how you. how was your social life? Did you have time to do anything else but architecture? Well, exactly. That's uh, you are completely right. That's the point. That's the absolutely the point because I like you know I shared with you all those uh, fun uh, memories of childhood with uh, uh, the dog and so on. But the truth is that I'm um, I'm actually coming from let's say, complex or a difficult um, uh, upbringing. Uh, so um, uh, so when, uh, when I was uh, a kid, then when I was a teenager or young adult, I would um, kind of cope with the high stress environment by uh, creating a very safe bubble around me. So... Um, already when I was very, very little, I would study a lot. So um, what I, um, so uh, it's not that I was conscious about it back then. I can tell you about it because I, I did a lot of, um, of work on myself. And uh, so, you know, the books have a beginning and an end. And uh, as, a, as a young person, uh, studying is something you can control 
So at least I had something I could rely on in uh, in my life. So that's why already when I was in um, in high school, I had you know very high rates, and I I I would uh, get the teachers to like to let me tutor other other people. But the reality is, I wasn't doing much out of studying. Uh, and that's very sad. I, it's another thing I, I um, uh, somehow regret. Of course, uh, I, uh, my parents would uh, try to push me to do some uh, sports, but I always found uh, studying much uh, safer than anything else. But I, I don't think you should, I mean, r- yeah, I don't, I don't think that regretting something is the right word because in the end of the day, I think um, it's everything we do. It's part of. It's a piece of a puzzle to where we get now. So if you got yeah. where you are now, and um, um, yeah, it's it's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I too. understand what it's, you're saying. It's, it's sometimes I was thinking about it today that uh, I think the m- most hard hard uh, moments and hardship uh, in in life a person has had. The, the happier they are on a daily basis. Because when you have experienced mm. something really hard or something really difficult or something really bad that has happened to you once, and maybe, and you know, they say this thing that it's super cheesy, if it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. But I think it makes sense because every day, for example, I have experienced some hardship and every day that this hardship, it's not happening, I'm happy because today I think, okay, today everything... Mm. Uh, could have been yeah. way wronger. It's than, a relief. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's okay. It's like it can go way yeah. way wronger than than what it is now. So yeah, but um, it's important because um, you know you can spend your time. You have a limited amount of time. Everyone gets the same amount of time per day, and you can spend it. You know, you can put your minutes only on certain things, and then if you didn't put all the the time that you have put in learning these things, you wouldn't have gotten where you're now because you have gathered these yeah, skills. Yeah, I and, know. And I know. I'm actually, I, I, I think the same, uh, but uh, I also want to be honest because uh, I think, of course, like um, uh, today when I look at it, I'm like, okay, I'm very thankful for all the work I put into into studying but uh, it, it's also very much uh, true at, on the other side that while growing up i would uh, i would also feel uh, different or i would uh, you know kind of i don't know have this kind of uh, feelings um also yeah ah <laughs> but yes i understand what you mean and um it, it's uh, very much true and i uh, I, I am also very, very thankful for the previous version of me. And um, I, I, me personally, as a person that gets to know you today, I can tell you that uh, uh, you should look back with, um, you know, with, of course, uh, when you distance with time from events that are in the past, you can uh, appreciate them more. So with appreciation and uh, that, Everything that you have done, it's it's been it it wasn't uh, wasteful. And talking about yeah. you leaving Napoli for Bologna, I experienced. So I was born in Bulgaria. So then I moved to Italy, and when I was twenty three, moved to Germany. And despite it's just <gasps> one hour flight, it's a very different world, and you have to adapt a lot. Yeah, of course. To the local culture, how was for you moving from Italy? to Denmark and I was in Denmark this last mm. year and the just the environment is so much different and I don't mean the climate <laughs> just the how everything looks like how was for you moving to well, Denmark it... and uh, yeah mm. okay mm. well first uh, thing I am uh, I survived because I got a lot of rainproof uh, equipment <laughs> Before coming to Denmark, no, um, I actually had the feeling uh, to to be home. Uh, so it's true, Napoli is beautiful. Uh, 
it's uh, it's also very different. It's very chaotic. I like to say that it's a crazy, crazy city. Um, but um, I don't know. Sometimes uh, I I really love I really love Copenhagen. And after I think two days of moving here, I felt I I didn't want to leave. Uh, you know, it, it's. Especially, sorry, I'm doing this a sound. Oh. <laughs> no, we are not on TV. You can talk as you, we were in a, like we talk <laughs> like we were on, on a coffee table and drinking a coffee yeah. or a wine or a beer. So you can do all the sounds. Just tell me the story. I'm interested in hearing it. No, but it's it's uh, weird because, you know, I'm Italian and I supposed to feel uh, somehow... And not very similar to this society, but uh, sometimes I think I'm more similar to Danes than uh, to Neapolitan somehow. Like for sure, I'm probably much more um, um, outgoing or uh, um, I don't know, some stereotypes like like that. But uh, I, I really like the fact that uh, here people have so much respect for um, uh, for people and uh, they are so kind, and uh, everything works. And, you know, when I was going in a university, I, it's technically 15 minutes from my place to the university. I had to start to go there two hours in advance because you never know if the train is coming. You never know if it's too full. And um, I, I don't know. I think then... Um, when I moved here, I understood how much stress uh, was in, in, in my daily life. I, I feel that life is uh, smooth and um, you, uh, I, I like it. I like uh, taking my bike and uh, um, being able to go everywhere. Uh, and uh, this uh, gives me a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of freedom. And as a woman, I finally fe- feel, you know, I don't need anyone to protect me i can be in the middle of the street at 4 a.m and and i feel safe and this means a lot to me and also the fact that um, you don't feel that the people uh, are uh, judgmental Um, i feel very much um, like free of being whoever i am when i'm since i'm here so um I don't know. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think I, I understand I what you it. meant. I wouldn't be here. I think I understand what you mean. Like, um, um, I as a as a person that's like adopted Italian, let's say, because I, as I told you, I have a different background and I just grew up there. Um, it's uh, it, to me, Italy. It's a very particular pr- place in every single aspect. It's like very. Uh, it's the it's the place of the extremes, in my opinion. There is extremely mm. nice things, extremely bad things, uh, exceptional things. And it's so... You can see it because there are also a lot of people like you that um, I'm so fascinating that I talk to so many people in design and architecture that I didn't know and I didn't, I didn't know you. I have to... I, I go and look for people. And then I found a lot of Italians that are doing some extremely exceptional things that are at so mm. high level. And I think it's such a pity mm. that the um, culture of the country, it's not uh, keeping up with this, yeah. uh, with this uh, people that are so, so many in Italy and it's crazy. Uh, but for example, yeah. when I moved here, I, there is this, uh, this guy, uh, I don't remember what is the name of, the guy, but he wrote a book, um, the subtle art, a subtle art of not giving a fuck, and he ah, yes. he lived in many countries, and he says the best of one country is also the worst of one country. And for example, mm. I love Germany, but you have to, for example, in Germany you have to always like mm, there is no room for spontaneity you know like you have to for example if you yeah. want to meet up with friends you have to tell them in advance you cannot be just yeah. like oh today i feel like going to have a beer and they're like mm, 
but today I'm busy, but I could do it in three weeks. <laughs> so, so, but in the other, on the oh. other hand, in Italy, everyone is spontaneous, but they're always spontaneous. You tell them we have to do this and meet this at this time. And they will say yes, but if it's going to happen, it's uh, really uncertain. So, uh, so I think every, yeah. ev everything that it's so good, it can be also the, the worst. And, and when I was in Denmark, I felt, I mean, compared to Germany, Uh, regarding the efficiency of transportation in the city, it's not so much different. I live in Frankfurt, so it's among the most livable cities in the world. But what I notice is that I think the people in Denmark uh, have a different character because there is a different climate and a different environment. And they have sort of built mm -hmm. these uh, living rooms as... Uh, like public living rooms, as, yeah. as Kobe says, to even enable the possibility to interact with other people. Because we went actually to all the libraries that Kobe has designed uh, in this uh, mm -hmm. different neighborhood. And it was so funny to see how uh, the environment outside is harsh and then you enter in this library and then you see, I don't know, kids going barefoot around and it's all... Yeah. It's it's all like it's so cozy. Yeah, it's so cozy, cozy, but it's also like everyone gets like have sort of gets in there and gets a little wilder in there, and then when they leave, they're again like a little bit more <laughs> more. Uh, how do you say? Not structured, <laughs> but like uh, Stiff. yeah, yeah. Maybe. So so it was so fascinating to see how like in in Italy you don't need it because the climate like for example in Napoli you live on the street you know you just go in the piazza to, yeah. and you know that you're going to meet the people in the piazza but you cannot do that in Denmark at least not as many months as in Italy so that was that was so interesting to to see in person and i think that it's super fascinating to experience uh, like something northern than 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 what i what i know Um, and so I guess for you it was easy to <clears throat> to adapt in the in the local culture. And how was it professionally? Uh, did you choose Denmark just because it happened, or you really aim to go to Denmark? Oh, I I honestly chose uh, Trixen, um, not uh, Denmark. Uh, so as um, um, so it was very much a surprise because with my family we didn't travel much. So um i i did i didn't know so many other places and i never been in um like in copenhagen before uh, yeah actually moving here so um i i don't know i i was more okay yeah i love uh, their uh, architecture and uh, why not i'm gonna fly and <laughs> and uh, then it just happened and i feel very lucky about it that i felt in love with the copenhagen so I uh, yeah I didn't know how good uh, it is uh, Scandinavia in general um I think there is no comparison for uh, for my field like for our field And uh how was it prof like what ca what kind of role did you get when you moved to Tricks and you were So I was already an a... architect because no, you applied uh, as a... So I I would I... Wait a second. There, yeah, is a there, is a some... there is some delay, probably. Ah, some delay. No, um, but I just uh, I. Sorry. If you if you want, you can try to refresh the page and enter again, and maybe it's it's gonna be better. Yeah. So few minutes and we're back. Don't go away. Uh, if you have any questions, I saw Apostolia was really active in the in the chat. So here you are, you're mm. back. Now it's better. I see you better. A chat where people are uh, writing. How does it work? Uh, yeah, because for the few people that are in the Patreon group, they are have the link for the conversation. So usually uh, they, they, they send the questions for the final Q&A at the end. Usually in the end of the okay. podcast, I'll read to you the questions that are coming from the chat. Uh, Okay. So it's it's there are some interesting questions, but uh, th let's first finish yeah, the. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> let's first finish I'm the curious. story. Um, but uh, I can tell you about it. So uh, when uh, 
Ah, so I was very much unprepared to uh, do any kind of a professional work interview because till that moment, as I told you, I uh, it was more like okay, my rates talking for me, my professors talking for me, and um, some kind of connections. It was always revolving around academics, uh, so it was actually the first time me interfacing uh, really. Um, um, such uh, a big international office, and um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. I, uh, I remember I was in the very south in Calabria with basically no Wi-Fi when I got their email, and I just, you know, I was there connecting the laptop, very old laptop with my phone, and I didn't even know and think they would you know ask me to to talk about my portfolio if i think of it i'm like oh my god how young and naive i was and uh we had that this uh, very bad wi-fi and every now and then it would just uh, stop it was i thought it was really really terrible experience <laughs> i thought oh my god i performed so bad because also the english i had back then was only coming from school so i had already this thing like hi i'm at liana i'm uh, uh, studying no studying i'm uh, working for uh, mario cucinella architects uh, stuff like that um and uh, and I also remember uh, the people I was having the interview with, Jesper and uh, Laura, they are still there. And I, they were not smiling at all. I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> okay, at least I made an experience. Next time, I'll know how to do it better. But somehow they sent me, uh, you know, uh, a message, uh, an email uh, two hours after. And then uh, they told me they wanted me to join them as soon as possible. So then... I don't know, I got this uh, this contract and when I was reading through, I thought it was uh, too good to be true. Um, um, it, it, you know, here in Denmark, like right now, the office is basically empty. At five um, in, in or even four, we, we are done with work. And I remember when reading in my contract, I was like, oh. This is impossible. Why are they even writing about it if it's not true? And uh, <laughs> uh, I remember in, in <laughs> seriously, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know anything just to tell you because I just jumped. Uh, I wasn't, you know, um, uh, this wasn't planned. I, I just I just wanted to try out. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I wanted uh, to challenge myself and to grow and to um, to make my English become better and, and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, it, when I moved, I remember my brain was melting. I don't know you in Germany, but, you know, um, luckily it's... Uh, Trixen is really, really international, so it's like full English. But uh, I remember these, uh, like, weeks or uh, maybe first months where I I was really like just listening a lot because it was so much work for me to uh I don't know to to switch from Italian to English it was uh yeah um, but now here I am talking with you on a podcast in English so very do, proud <laughs> do you do you know some Danish too no, very few words. I heard, I actually listened to, um, is is she called Dalila, uh, the other Italian architect living in uh, Copenhagen? Uh... No, maybe I'm wrong. But I, um, so I had a completely different experience compared to this, um, this girl because um, being in an international environment, uh, actually, Official. yeah, you don't need much uh, Danish. So I know the important words. So to cheer, you say school. <laughs> no, I know I'm learning because I want to, you know, re um, yeah. You mean that Danila? I you, and I want to stay. You meant Danila. Danila, we had her on the podcast. Danila, okay, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, everyone has a different experience because, I mean, everyone has different life and that's the beauty of it, that if I interview another 10 architects that moved to Copenhagen, 
they will tell me everyone a different story. So that that's the nice part of it. And um, how was yeah. how, how was working in in a, a part of the the language and everything? I totally understand you because when I came here, I arrived as an Erasmus student, and then I saw everybody at the at the university were working as uh, interns in other offices, and I thought, oh my god, they must be so good in Italy. I didn't even know how an architecture office looked like, uh, but then we started doing the classes, mm. and uh, and. Um, And I was like, but they're not so good. They're not geniuses. They just speak German. So I have to learn a little bit of German and uh, try to land a job. And uh, then I started working for a company and they they were paying me, I remember, 11 euros per hour. And I was like, this is crazy. Oh. I'm making so much money. How is this even possible? And they would make <laughs> me do like uh, all the Photoshop for competitions and things. And I was like, and this is even fun. If they asked me to do it for free, I would have done it for free. But they're paying me. So I totally understand what you mean. And I had the same uh, difference to really be focused on what they're speaking in German because my German wasn't that good. So I would have this uh, friend of mine of university who was working in the same office and I would ask him, what did he say? Like, what did the boss say but in English so that I know what I have to do? And uh, it was a crazy adventure. <laughs> um, so what were your first task? What were your tasks? What were some projects that you worked on that maybe you can share about? Mm, some of I them maybe are built, so it's not secrecy I, anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I think there is another good thing about Denmark, which is um, uh, flat management. So uh, it's not very, um, I don't know if you say hierarchical or hierarchical. Anyway, um, you, um, you always feel you have a voice. So uh, people trust you and uh, they give you responsibilities. And Best of all, at the end, everyone is going to always say thank you and be very kind with you, which is something I really, really admire and like about Denmark. Sorry, it seems I'm like Denmark, Denmark is <laughs> actually a very nice place to work in. And um, uh, so I don't know, they, they, um, I was in the competition department at uh, Trixen, uh, so I would have uh, quite a, a tight um, timeline every time. Uh, I, I would do so, so many competitions uh, during the year. And, uh, you know, you do uh, massing study, facade design, and yeah, I actually worked both like in uh, early stages and later, you know, when you win a competition and you do, um, you do move into uh, more like design development. And uh, of course, I, I had like still my skills in uh, computational design and I am actually like uh, also very, um, very passionate Uh, on on the side about uh, like graphics, so it was also something I liked uh, to uh, to do. But uh, you know, in uh, in um, in here, they do understand what you are good at, and then uh, they try to give you all the opportunities to uh, to improve, get more skilled, and you know, just uh, perform as much as possible for uh, for uh, for the company. So, for example, like. I don't know the first I'm um, the first uh, thing I'm thinking of uh, when I think of tricks and is uh, the um, Shenzhen uh, museum uh, in uh, China so I've been uh, working on that since the very beginning so since it was very much a secret uh, a competition and uh, you know that's a uh, 100,000 square meter museum and uh, all of that is uh, parametrized uh, so Uh, I, I was like working full time because, of, and you know about it when you work with uh, with the clients, and especially when they are from Asia, there is very much a different uh, process. So the brief is uh, changing all the time. The um, and uh, everything goes so fast, and uh, like you know, we were making the changes, and they were like pouring the foundations <laughs> and um, uh, you know so uh, every time they were changing the program uh, we would uh, adjust the, ch the shape and then you know to optimize all of that we would have 
um, you have like these uh, cones inside uh, the, um, the Shenzhen Museum, which work as a structure. So also all the structure would be parameterized, all the end. Um, all the openings to the exhibitions inside. Uh, we we had like at the beginning a lot of ramps, uh, then a lot of stairs. So uh, I don't know. There is um, it's yeah. I I turn in uh, being of course um, uh, very much in my field, so in uh, computational design. But do you? But do you? Um, so. You were involved into parameters like again the modeling part or how like is there a person that's more involved into uh, designing the thing and then you guys really give it the uh, uh, rules and parameters or the computation no. of the one design team is the one designing actually no uh, we actually uh, made uh, the competition for Shenzhen uh, in uh, we were three people and uh, it's um, of course it depends on the project uh, but uh, for uh, that kind of shape uh, I uh, maybe it was a two phases competition so at the beginning um, you use more uh, computational design in order to extract data like uh, square meters, a volume, or uh, I don't know, some other technical things they were interested in or to like model very fast um, some interiors or some features um, of of the final shape like facades and so on. And, um, and then, of course, uh, when you have a more clear idea, especially when it's a very complex one, and a, you you cannot model it by hand, like um, it's it's in, um, unfortunately like it's impossible to keep up uh, with the, the timeline if you uh, just work merely in uh, in a rhino um, for this kind of project then uh, there are some other things uh, where you can um, I don't know you give uh, some kind of structure as a computational designer and then um, other people can actually play with uh, the definition or uh, I don't know uh, contribute in it's it's very much a teamwork uh, and and it's ever changing because you know projects are never the same. And during my career, I've been very, very lucky because I worked on very large range of projects. And uh, were these people that were in team with you, all of them, they were uh, computational experts, or there is no one person? So how does it? Because I always say this: it's super. Like for example, it's super intimidating when you go and, for example, if people Google, I mean, we can. Maybe in the edit, put some images of this uh, museum that everybody maybe have seen him seen this museum somewhere because it's so it was all over the place when it got released the first images, and it looks like uh, this uh, I don't know snake dragon because it's also about natural natural history so it looks like really like uh, it's a very yeah. interesting shape, um, and. So you were very uh, skilled in computational and um, and grasshopper and so on. Uh, in what what kind of expertise did the other people have? In a in a team, um, usually, what other so, experts? So uh, one are needed? of them. So one of them was uh, much more into uh, pure management. Because, you know, uh, there is also a lot of work to do into interfacing the client. Uh, but uh, let's say I, I feel like you always uh, find some kind of balance. You know, there is uh, maybe uh, someone who is uh, more searching into the story behind the concept, um, some kind of uh, vision images. Everyone would, uh, of course, a sketch uh, and uh, I can help with the sketching and then uh, I don't know how to explain. It's, uh, it's not linear at all. And um, uh, one thing about, um, uh, I think, working in this kind of offices is that, again, the flat management. So you do have a very good relationship with your teammates. And I, I remember that, um, you know, we would work as a one body. So if you get one idea, then the other one with the hand can help into, you know, uh, doing the shape. It's, um, I don't know how to explain. 
Yeah, no, no, I understand. It's like a a flat hierarchy. It's like everybody contributing Mm. and working together. Yeah. And um, no, that's that's because we have had also uh, Fred Fred Holt. Probably you know him. He his partner three xn So uh, he also told uh, told some things about the company. But you know, when you ask more people if the if the path is recurring, then it means it's true. So it's good to ask you too. And um, uh, it is. It is. And and, and at at what point did you? Um, had the opportunity to move to Kobe because when we were in Copenhagen, it's so funny because through um, through the podcast, I one of because there are so many architecture offices in Copenhagen. I know a lot of people now that work in Copenhagen, so you know they would tell me stories, and it's not so uh, not so imp- because there are so many good offices, so people switch. Um, at what point did you have the opportunity to to move to Kobe, and how did you decide to do this next move? Yeah, so uh, as you said, it's uh, very very common in Denmark for people to uh, move uh, and to just uh, do different experiences, and I feel that uh, uh, all the big international offices are somehow a family. So you get to know everyone. Like when you go to parties, you're just like always meeting everyone. And uh, um, I decided to uh, to move to Kobe in 2021. Uh, and it was uh, basically, uh, let's say here in Denmark, it was already better with the pandemic. And I think we have been quite lucky uh, with it. Um, but, at the same time, uh, it was a moment of my life with, and uh, I, I'm sure this is the same for many other people where, where I thought, you know, I couldn't uh, travel much or I couldn't do any other kind of experience that would uh, help me grow. Uh, so that was also a moment of life where I, I again wanted to challenge myself more. I wanted to to see different ways of working. And let's be clear, I was always uh, admiring Kobe very much and I was keeping an eye on it. Um because of course if you if you like Copenhagen, uh uh, somehow lo- you you end up loving Kobe because Kobe has been uh, having such a big role into the transformation of Copenhagen into a bustling um, democratic city uh, designed for living. Uh, so I, you know, I, I, I right now I live close to Noreport Station, so close to Israel Platz. When I go for a swim, I go in Croyer Platz. And in summer, and if you didn't do it, do it, and it's also quite affordable, I rent a, a boat with my friends, and we go around the canals. And the area I prefer the most is where Papiron is, and where our opera park is coming. So, uh, you know, I could ex- experience as a person, um, uh, all these uh, outdoor uh, living rooms. And I could really understand how Kobe could have uh, somehow a very deep knowledge about the background. So uh, another thing that really resonates with uh, um, especially my uh, previous experiences and um, um, the academic world is uh, this uh, um, this uh, study, this understanding of the um, of the background, the historical traces. Uh, so every time I feel we really push to do an extraordinary design that fits in. So somehow an architecture that is uh, grounded into reality. But at the same time, it stands up. So if you think of the silo very close by in North Down, right there, uh, uh, like Kobe took garbage, like a next grain silo, an industrial building, and he turned it into a landmark for the city. And uh, of course, that is like very very um impressive and uh, and in general like um i 
<laughs> I don't know. I think there is uh, uh, there is also the right mixture between uh, all these uh, tiny um, projects like these uh, green gems or uh, purse, and then uh, the big international projects. So um, I I found uh, Kobe very interesting. Oh, I see it. That's Here nice. you go. We yes. have uh, an old school way of sharing your screen. I'm just showing the book yes. here that I have it here. This is the silo. But for yes. the people that haven't been to Copenhagen again, promotional uh, moment, there is all the serious visit Copenhagen like an architect. And of course, we went to visit the silo and the, the Kobe office. So it's uh, it's all there. No, it's true. I, w- I was there. So I... Yes. I think um, my girlfriend always says that she's uh, happy when she travels with me because uh, we visit a lot of, um, you know, a lot of architecture. And so when um, when she's with me, she, ca- she doesn't like so much uh, historical things because she likes to be connected to people that are mm-hmm. that are around nowadays. And uh and so visiting Copenhagen was a really nice uh, experience because I knew all these projects. So we went and uh, we went to that library. I don't know, the one that looks like a TV. I don't know how it's called. Um, the one that's out of wood. Yeah, oh, I have trouble saying uh, in the proper uh, Danish, but I I know which one you're talking uh, of. Maybe later I'll show it in the book, but we went there and we sat and we smelled the wood and we read some books inside and it was so beautiful to just experience uh, to just experience the the exactly what you said and and we went to we we were we saw the construction side of um of P- paper island uh because it was but it was quite complete already it was quite it now now probably it's almost finished yeah it was so fast it was very impressive because I was always biking there to go to Trix and, and uh, you know, it would just grow, grow, grow so, so fast, so fast. Yeah. And um, so what is your daily life at Kobe nowadays? What is your role? What is what is head of computation mm. now? Because, uh, again, are you a person that people go? Yeah. How, how does it work? You can explain it by, by yourself. <laughs> okay. So what already um, I think I introduced before is that uh, Kobe um, is always um, really putting an effort into creating an extraordinary design that is uh, long lasting, resilient, innovative, and we like to say future proof. So uh, as a company, if you want to be future proof, then you have to look also about on you know the way you are working so the workflow and to have a future proof uh workflow you actually need to use i believe computational design because what we do is uh actually using scripts to uh, to um, to to work in a fast smart clean efficient uh flexible way and so um okay let me think about it how i can uh, explain it uh to you so uh so um the work that, that we do is to try always to um analyze what are the let's say brainless repetitive tasks that uh, are actually slowing down people so the first thing i do is uh I'm a bit of a, a drug dealer. So I go around the office and I like, you know, connecting to people, see what they are doing and ask, uh, okay, do you have anything that you find boring, something you are repeating over and over? Or is that something you believe you could do faster? Do you have a dream? And uh, this uh, first interaction uh, actually many times brings uh, me, and I, I want to say us because it's it's always, of course, teamwork to, um, first of all, uh, realize tools that can help in the everyday life. Um, and if you actually think about it, there are things that, very simple things, 
that you repeat over and over into projects. So let's say you will always have some kind of a stair, ramp, balustrade, um, just talking about simple elements. So why should you do the same job every time? Why should you, yeah, just uh, draw it once and then the client comes with another idea and you have to do it again. We can just uh, like work into completely cutting this kind of a brainless work. Um, at the same time, we use computational design for more complex uh, things. So uh, if you go through our website, um, I think uh, it's very hard to get a full overview of what Kobe is because, of course, as you said, we do have so much that we can share. Like there is so much going on. And for example, uh, one thing I've been very involved with is an awesome but also very, very secret project, which is in one of the biggest cities in the world. And it is a 650,000 building. So it is not a master plan. Like everyone knows that Kobe is good with urban visions. But this is a mixed use building. So you do need that extra layer that uh, computational design is giving uh, to model in a smart way. So we make sure that we always check all the data. We make sure that all the facades can be updated. We make sure that even in such a large scale, we can go to the human size. And, uh, you know, you have to make sure that uh, you create this kind of perfect machine that is uh, like very, very smooth. So uh, in in this case, of course, it's been a, um, a longer process. So it can happen, as I told you, that I just like interact with one person or one team. So I work as a, a consultant for a short amount of time. It can also be a few hours because, you know, if you need to just like um, uh, have a balustrade done, I can just, you know, change a few things in a script and give it to you. This is also something I really like, like giving power to people. So you don't need me. You can do it yourself. You change the parameters and you can actually get whatever design you you prefer. Uh, and then there is this other kind of work with more like complex projects uh, where I actually need to follow the team for a longer time because there will be so much work coming in many different aspects. It can be also for environmental simulations, so daylight analysis um, or uh, optimize um, um, adaptive facades. Uh, so, uh, well, um, it is very, very flexible because um, I, I, I like to say I have my doors open, so there is this... Uh, a policy where everyone is welcome at my desk uh, or to send me, to drop me a message and just like, you know, uh, tell me a bit what, what, what they are dreaming of. Uh, for example, like I, I just got a meeting with a guy that was really, really tired of doing these uh, fire analysis, uh, like where to locate, um, the uh, how to locate the buildings like every time is uh, you know um, is actually such a um, uh, repetitive work and you don't need your creativity for that like you 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 actually work as a machine in that moment when you're doing this job so you could see the potential of computational design and together we tried to find you know the process the logic behind and then i you know sometimes i built the entire script and I give it to the person other times when the person is interested, then we can build it together. Or I, if the person is more experienced, because of course we have also some uh, people who, who actually know Grasshopper, then in that case, it's more like a teamwork. It's like we can brainstorm about it. And if you, I don't know, for example, I love uh, complex uh, geometries, as I told you. So uh, if you have something particularly uh, weird that maybe doesn't come immediately to your mind, then we can meet and uh, I can give you some tips about it. So it's, 
is different. What I also do in the office is, of course, is innovation. So I make sure that uh, I get as much as possible updated and I uh, always like communicate with the office. So I do um, uh, like knowledge sharing um, and um, yeah, that is another aspect where you can see like, you know, the teaching coming back. Um, yeah, I think I told you more or less about uh, everything. Like in in few keywords, I'm like responsible for the strategic planning and the practical development of all the computational design method in the company. Okay. But are you involved also in the conceptual work when like in the all beside doing all of this, are you involved uh, maybe in one, two projects like involving your architect skills or you're mostly like the, the ena enabler, let's say that empowers in these people? Office Uh, well, um, in this office, since there is so much work to do for the office itself and uh, so many teams to follow up, my role is mo uh, more like the one empowering people. No, that's that's cool. So the, the tool uh, dealer. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't call yourself a drug dealer as you come from Naples because somebody can uh, take it seriously. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's well. just a joke. It's just a joke. It's just a joke. And uh, I'm curious, um, in your opinion, what um, I guess that that's a very the part of the culture of the country in Denmark that there is. I mean, I don't think that there will be uh, our office that there is not a flat hierarchy and not uh, you know all being uh, equal and uh, you know uh, listened to because it's very. It's the culture of the country, right? It's very democratic, very empowering everyone yeah. and giving a voice to everyone. Um, what um, I know, I, I, I learned while I was there, even if it was just for a week, that, uh, that it, there, is, there is not a lot of acceptance for people that are too much uh, like the rock star or the, the solo players. Uh, but That's what true. but what is the what is the role of of Dan in in the in the in the spirit of Kobe because it's he's the creative mm -hmm. director he, he, he's the founder um is something that he has sort of uh, um implemented or is the whole team that somehow it's always constructed to achieve this um these results that are so typical for Kobe like Kobe has this aura this spirit that if i think uh, uh if i wanted to see uh as i said the most uh, fitting project for that for that place i would think of kobe no other office despite all there are other offices that are very good and uh but do different kind of work mm. i have to say like uh, here and in general in denmark is always a teamwork and um, uh, to me, it's completely different compared to, you know, uh, Italy, where maybe um, you have the project manager or uh, the project director or the owner taking the decision. Like, um, oh, of course, they can help you to finding the best solution possible. It can they definitely contribute with their vision. But at the same time, is always the entire team and everyone, as I said, have really have a voice. And um, um, I don't know, in Denmark, like you go lunch uh, to lunch and you sit with everyone. Um, it's um, you really feel there is no difference between people. Of course, you have different responsibilities. So, um, everyone, of course, uh, um, <laughs> is a, a different role in a way, but this doesn't mean that uh, everyone doesn't have, don't have power. Like, I, I don't know. I think it's very hard to explain if uh, people didn't experience it because uh, to me, if someone would 
tell me about it when I was in Italy. I I don't know if I could uh, ever image a place where uh, I don't know you have such a beautiful harmony within an office. It's um, yeah. And is there internal? Uh, is there internal? Like for example, internally, not, a lot of offices have shared with me on on the podcast in the conversation that they internally have like this. Um, time schedule to for example someone for example you are very good at grasshopper and you do an hour or two hours workshop to teach the others how to use uh, yeah. grasshopper uh, is there for example also some workshops by people that are more involved into creating the concepts and the designs maybe to also teach mm -hmm. you the not only the you know the technicalities of things but also the way of thinking the way of Uh, like um, making that concept mm. what we do uh, here is that uh, um, once every two weeks on a Friday having breakfast everyone um, um, is welcome to share so you do have um, an hour office meeting where people are also talking about you know how the concept um worked and what inspired them and you know the full story so then in this case you can like really understand the way other people think and how the project um, why the pro project is in a certain way and that is like uh, some kind of brainstorming where you you learn about these let's say other uh, abilities yeah that sounds interesting that would be Because, you know, I understand that every, like, this is very, in Germany, it's also like this, you always speak up, uh, especially because when you, when, when you work on a project, you're sometimes so much involved into certain topics and into certain specifications of that project that you're the only one that is able to see where are the problems and how to solve them. And if it comes always from the top, the solution, it wouldn't work because uh, maybe mm. your boss doesn't know what was the problem of that specific topic and what was all the process behind it into arriving to that conclusion. So, uh, and I think that's, uh, again, a pit, that's like a, I also more for the hierarchical, um, um, for the flat hierarchy and for empowering everyone to to do their part and also it's very nice to give a person a responsibility and let them do something by themselves because then they feel mm. more happy afterwards because they solved the problem yeah uh, and that's also something that i think for example you said you go and try to you know um optimize uh the process right you have you you will try to Uh, see those uh, tasks that are tedious and uh, to to improve them i think nowadays at some point when the uh, the the offices are at the scale of kobe uh, and i also work in a big office um, the problem is that um, i feel you lose a little bit your um, abilities of doing it by yourself i don't know what i if you know what i mean like for example if there is a certain way of working with grasshopper and revit and everything in kobe uh, if they give you a pure revit or a pure rhino without all the enablers that have been created it will be very hard to use for example i work in a very big office where we had to use revit in a very specific way with all the possible standards, layers. Uh, the, For example, we had a B manager who would set up uh, everything for you and you would just need to make the walls and it was like playing The Sims. And I told this is, yeah, it's <laughs> nice for the company, but it's not nice for me because if you were to give me Revit in my own hands, uh, yeah, I would come up with a solution, but it wouldn't be so quick. Uh, so I don't know, this, uh, these things is nice, but it's also like, uh, I don't know, I'm a person that likes to be also to, to know how things work. So if I were to work uh, with you, I would be constantly telling you, 
okay, Eliana, let, let's go through this parameter. How did you do it? I want to learn the, from scratch. Yeah, but I love that. I love that. And there are definitely people who are interested in learning. And then you can, you know, do that extra step into going through the entire script. And, uh, and then you also make sure that you can, they can put their ends into it and like, you know, improve it or change it in case they need. I think that's the best. I, I think that um, in general, everyone should uh, contribute to whatever it is, even the standards. Um, and yeah, but I get what you mean. I feel being in the Rhino world is, is a bit uh, different compared to Revit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And um, I was wondering, I'm going to ask you this one last question. I'm not going to keep you. And then we're going to go through the questions from the audience so that I, I want yeah. to let you go home. I don't want you to stay super late. <laughs> uh, but no worries. Uh, when we go after the one and a half hours, it means that the guest is super interesting. And uh, it's not... Oh, my God. Is it? <laughs> I oh, told you. It's, it's, it flies. I actually thought we were going quite fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's always like this, uh, that people think it's go, it's just a few minutes that we're in, but we're talking for, for a long time. Um, for example, I'm a person that is interested in many topics. Uh, this is why I do a podcast and I do things online, because it's something interesting to me. But in the same time, I'm very interested into, I don't know, grasshopper or into architectural design or into graphic design or into video editing or into learning a new language. So I would love to do all this stuff. And I'm more like a person that um, I'm a, a generalist, I think, that I could uh, qu quickly pick up Grasshopper and understand it, and but maybe not get at the level that you are. And uh, But I can do a lot of things, you know, like I can do a lot of things at a quite okay level, but I don't know, I always am curious for more. And do you think you're, um, do you have, are you more like a vertical skill person that like really loves you love to be an expert in this thing? Is it like, do you have other curiosities that <laughs> you like to, it, it's not a bad thing. There is a book, it's called okay, okay. So, so Good They Can Ignore You and exactly <laughs> telling you this, get super good at this one thing and nobody, and, and it was your case because a lot of people contacted you to work with you because they knew you were very, high level expert in that specific thing so what is your opinion on this yeah you're a very yeah. vertical expert okay okay so um i am uh, more like a bit more like a vertical maybe person so there is like the boring part of how i get inspired which is like okay of course um talking with a lot of people in the office getting updated and then like being updated on the other side with youtube linkedin i also do a lot of that on the side and talking about slightly more fun another step like i like um you know, uh, I like getting creative um, uh, when I work on something uh, much more fun, uh, kind of when I can image myself as a, this big kid in a playground. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you saw it, um, this project I worked with my friend, uh, Marc Antoine, is called Fungus Among Us. And we did it with um, parametric architecture. And uh, I was imagining, you know, myself just uh, climbing and uh, jumping from uh, one wooden mushroom to another. And uh, somehow when uh, you kind of um, uh, get that uh, playfulness and uh, you have uh, fun uh, while designing, somehow it gets, um, I don't know, uh, it, it gets some success. So it's been like, I don't know if you know this, but it's been two years that the parametric architecture is uh, using this uh, mushroom every time they want to do some advertisement, you know, if you have to subscribe to the newsletter or uh, like the Black uh, Friday and so on. So uh, I think um, something I really like is um, 
in architecture is uh, trying to think as a kid, having fun. Uh, another thing I get inspired with, again, among the boring one, I'm going like step by step, um, is uh, of course um, uh, teaching, which is like uh, a big, uh, is, is very important for me because you get to connect with people and um, I don't know, you I don't know, somehow the, the human uh, part like uh, kind of st stimulates new ideas. Then out of work, uh, I actually learned here in Denmark to have work, good life balance. So to connect a bit more the brain with the body. So I do something that is completely unrelated and probably you just need to shut down your brain. And uh, I do, I, I dance. I'm not good at it but I do some Afro dance and Bollywood dance. <laughs> and then now I started um, a course uh, where I, I learned to sing. So I don't know. It's, how are you, how it's you doing with very, the singing? Very, very different. How are you doing with the singing? Uh, <laughs> I just started. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not planning on becoming a singer. Okay, but uh, <laughs> but the next time the next time you come to our podcast, you can uh, show your skills in that uh, in that field. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm gonna do some kind of uh, you know dance and sing, and uh, we can uh, learn a computational design in a different way. And um, so to conclude, I want to go through with the questions from the audience. Yeah. There are three questions. Uh, they yes. come all from Apostolia. She's always very active and she comes up with this um, interesting question. So uh, you can decide in which length you want to answer to the question. But the first one is, wow. um, do you think the quality... Okay. Do you hear me? Hello? Yes. So, I'm uh, being... Uh... Very focused. <laughs> okay, first question. I'm going to read it to you. Do you think the quality and the originality of architectural project in the last 10 to 20 years are better or worse? And in what extent do you think computational design plays a role in this? So it means, is computational design making architectural projects more interesting or less interesting? And what what do you think about mm. this bef compared to the past? Mm. Well, I I think that uh, the design goes together with the technologies and uh, you know in general the knowledge. Uh, I think that in the past, especially being Italian or maybe Greek in her case, I don't know the name. Yes, sounds yes, Greek. she's Greek. Um, but there, she's. <laughs> But um, there are like uh, extraordinary things uh, in the past that uh, uh, somehow I'm still very fascinated of. And uh, when I go in these places, uh, you know, you really wonder how how they managed to do such a thing. Like uh, still, w w some of my favorite designs are like old uh, Gothic churches. <laughs> um, and uh, I I don't think that uh, just uh, using computational design uh, allows you to make sure your design somehow looks uh, uh, better. Uh, I believe it, it always depends on on the person that is uh, behind the um, the machine, the person who is uh, making the script. Um, for example, like when I uh, came for my interview at Kobe, what they told me is that uh, um, it was very hard during the years um, to find someone that was doing computational design with a certain um, aesthetic. Uh, because sometimes um, um, when... But, but it's not that I'm against uh, to it, but you know, there are these kind of exploration with the computational design that lead to um, a certain aesthetic that is um, sometimes um, very different compared to, um, uh, to the architecture that we do here. So I don't know. I, I believe uh, it's us as humans that give the power to the computer. So it's all about the, the person behind. So um, I think for sure computational design helps 
helps a lot into uh, expanding your uh, your vision and your abilities. Like I strongly believe that, like as a humans, we have limited abilities. So it's extremely important to use technologies right. Uh, and for example, right right now, no, we have AI, amazing. Like the like it's the way it's evolving is really remarkable um and like i can see uh a lot of potential into just doing what we have right now the text to image uh to just uh, you know open up your eyes into um into i don't know uh some different words doesn't mean that you need to translate it straight into architecture but you know um Yeah, it's like I a second know. imagination. I, I, I it. It's like imagining something yeah. that you wouldn't imagine. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. It's a very, very hard, hard question. No, I but you answered. Help, you but, uh, answered very interesting way, and I think um, uh, I think it's thank it's you. an answer. And then we go with the second question. Okay. Then uh, great. The second question, in, in probably, it's not so uh, difficult. Uh, for smaller offices that start to adjust to our new era now, if you had to choose, would you implement BIM or computational design? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I have one side. Well, you can say your side. I, That's a question uh, for you. This... <laughs> No, it's more like I feel I'm sold. I like I'm a computational designer, so I don't know. I see so many advance, advantages of, you know, uh, a company starting to work in a very smart, uh, efficient way because then uh, it can really um like optimize the time that people spend on actually Uh, you know, getting into the concept, exploring more and more. Um, it doesn't mean that you just have to do like a lot of different massings uh, without uh, thinking about it. But uh, now, for example, with the Enscape, you can really like, you know, walk around, get impressions. So to me, um, it's super important computational design, especially in the early stages to make sure that you can really uh stand out against your competitors and you can push forward the industry and you can come out with some extraordinary ideas. Yeah, that's that's true. I think I think for a small office that start, my personal opinion is that you should start really with Rhino because you can in the beginning implement it with some functions that kind of works as BIM and also um In the beginning, probably you won't have the most complex project in the world that you need BIM right away, but maybe later mm. on. This is my personal, after talking to so yeah, many maybe, people. Maybe, you know, when you're small, you'll... Yeah, but when you're small, you might want to win a lot of competitions first. <laughs> so then, uh, then you know, you, you grow. And... Um, In, uh, especially in these early uh, phases, you can get a lot of data out uh, with the computational design. Like, in a, but I, I feel I know more my side. I'm, so I'm, I'm not I'm a computational not designer and I've talked to you and to computational design experts at many other companies. A uh, big friend with Oliver Thomas, he's computational design expert at BIG. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm on your side with this. Um, and, and then I'm going to go with okay. the third, <laughs> third question. Yeah, uh, third. This is third and the last one. Uh, what would you prioritize as more important in a project? Time, costs, complexity of design process or results? <laughs> prioritize. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so it's a uh, time and cost. Com and complexity then, of design or results? Prioritize. Yeah, I don't get this question. I don't know I, if, if, yeah, if Apostolia I, I is still listening, she can elaborate more. Is it possible elaborate to more. write the question maybe? Oh, I can mm. share my screen to you. 
so that you can read it. Unfortunately, I'm a little bit uh, yes. of a, what is it called? Of a newbie in the streaming era. So uh, I have to... So do you see my screen now? Yes. So this is the question. I apostolia. Uh, I don't know if she's still on. Because Where is it? The third. The third one. No. What would you prioritize as most important? Time, costs, complexity of design process or results? But I, I, okay, if I get the, I don't know if I get the question right, but to me, time and costs go together. Because, you know, if you reduce as much as possible the time you spend on a project, then at the end, you're going to uh, gain more because maybe you can uh, use the same people on another project or, uh, um, yeah, you you maybe win the competition. So, but maybe, maybe uh, she means also me, costs of the building. Maybe she means also costs, ah. like also costs... Uh... Uh, or maybe uh, Luca yeah. is suggesting in the chat that maybe it's connected ah. to the to the second question, or maybe he's right. So um, mm. yeah, I don't know. Ap Apostolia has to. So is the time it's built? I think I have a bit of troubles, like just understanding really uh, the the question. But you can read it because you know, uh, as more important, like the complexity of the design process. To me, like to, to me, for example, the design process has to be very, very simple and smooth, like not complex at all. Like we can do a uh, complex design with a very par powerful technologies, with the complex scripts, but at the end it has to be very smooth and, and simple. So um, the results, I, I don't know if I understand this question, I'm sorry. Well, we we kind of we kind of sort of developed some thoughts about it, so I think uh, we can get it as a as a thought uh, process. Yeah, um, <laughs> and um, maybe next time she can text me. Yeah, you she can add you on Instagram on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, definitely. I'll put all the links in the description. But I mean, uh, people who are following here have followed on Instagram, so they. They have seen your profile everywhere tagged. Okay. So they will be able to connect. Yeah, but uh, feel free to reach out and uh, I will try to answer as best as I can. So then uh, we can understand better each other. Be before we go, I understand, um, I understood you have um, started a collaboration with Parametric Architecture, with the PAC, yes. with the Parametric <laughs> Architecture Academy. Uh, we, we know uh, the guys. They were also guests on the podcast. Um, so could you expand more what kind of uh, things people could learn if they go and join your class? Wow. Okay. I think everyone is ver everything is very much in the air in the sense that uh, Amit and I just uh, got one uh, very fun and exciting uh, conversation. I already uh, knew Amit, like we met uh, two years or more ago because, you know, of this uh, fungus among us. Um, and uh, we were like keeping already in touch. Uh, and I'm a big, big fan of a parametric architecture. And I really recommend to uh, people to follow their courses because you don't only get like some uh, theory and practical knowledge, but you end up really having a, um, something that you can put in your portfolio, for example. Or in my case, I, I do have a portfolio full of like beautiful buildings of like tricks and Kobe, but at the same time, it's, it was, it's so nice also for a professional to just, you know, get creative and think out of the box. So I'm going to have a workshop with the parametric architecture. It's going to happen um, either end of April or beginning of May. Um, I have in my mind a topic, but uh, um, since, as I told you, I really believe in uh, uh, playfulness and, um, you know, thinking of these uh, spaces that you can explore even as a, an adult in a somehow uh, kid kid way, I, I think I will do something related to that, but I'm, I, 
I still don't know, but I'm sure it will be shared quite soon, which is the, yeah, we are going to have another talk and then I will be able to, yeah. to talk a, a bit more about it. That's but great. But come, it's, because it's a... I love teaching and I'm sure it's going to like be great. And I, I, I really care of making sure that people can, uh, um, can then use these skills in their everyday life because, you know, we will do something a bit more fun that uh, like will bring us to some immediate results. But uh, as uh, like head of computational design, I also always care that what we learn is not just, you know, staying on your canvas and then you can actually use it or you can get at least some, um, some ideas and, and change the way you work. Yes, totally. Well, that's a reason for people to follow you so that they can uh, stay up to date uh, with what is going to yeah. happen in the workshop. And uh, I don't want to, yes. despite I have to say it's very nice talking to you, but I know that uh, it's hard, late in the evening and I want you to let you go home. Uh, before we go, I want to thank you very much for accepting this invitation. It was real, a real pleasure having you on and hearing your story. And I always say this is not, this is just your first time on, on the stage of the Creative Insider podcast, but in the future, every guest is always welcome back to share something new or something they want to talk. So thank you very much, Eliana. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. And it was like, I have to say, I was terrified, very excited, but also like scared. And uh, you made it like so easy. So thank you very much. That's that's thank the you. goal to have fun. So thank you. Uh, yes. Have a nice evening, everybody who connected, and um, bye bye. Bye. Ciao.